Hello, and welcome to the Texel Density Masterclass. My name is Tristan, and in this video, we'll cover everything there is to know about Texel Density, or at least everything you need to care about to use it meaningfully in the projects you may be working on. We'll start by defining Texel Density. We'll then look at a visual analogy and how we might increase or decrease Texel Density. We'll go through a common misconception of what Texel Density is, We'll then dive deeper into why we, or anyone else, should care about Texel Density. Finally, we'll test our newfound knowledge with a practical example of how to set Texel Density on our objects in Blender. Let's get started. So, what does the word Texel mean? It's a word formed from two other words, texture and element. Texture element density, or texel density, is the number of texture pixels associated with an object's surface area in 3D space. Texel density is expressed as pixels per centimeter, or sometimes pixels per meter. For the remainder of this video, I'll use centimeters. An important detail is that texel density deals with surface area in 3D space. Unlike a computer monitor or an image, an object in 3D space can have an unlimited number of pixels squeezed onto its surface area. So, as a quick example, I will mock up a 3D scene with two identically sized objects in it, both with the same surface area and texture applied, but sitting at different positions along the z-axis. If we place a camera in the scene and visualize what we see from the camera's perspective, the two objects would be different sizes. These two objects would also take up different amounts of space on the screen and therefore a different number of pixels. However, in the 3D scene, they still have the same number of pixels on their surfaces, irrespective of how many pixels they cover on the image produced by the camera. We'll touch on this crucial detail later in the video. Okay, let's look at a visual analogy of texel density. Here, I have three identically sized planes, each one by one meter. I've created and applied a texture to them with white squares on a black background. For this analogy, we'll imagine that the space between the white squares represents the amount of texel density. For example, the distance between the white squares on the first plane is less than the distance between the white squares on the plane next to it, meaning that the first plane has a higher texel density. The squares are more tightly packed. So, moving from left to right, we'll see that the texel density of each plane is decreased by half each time. I've set it up this way because it'll help visualize texel density as we increase or decrease it. So how do we increase or decrease texel density? Well, remember that it's a ratio between pixels and surface area. That means we have three ways to affect texel density when dealing with objects in real space. Why three? Good question. Let's go through each of them. The first is the most intuitive. To increase texel density on an object, we can increase its texture size. So, suppose I go to the shading tab and I replace the 1K texture I have present on these objects with an equivalent 2K texture. In that case, we'll see that the distance between the white dots decreases, packing the white dots closer together and increasing texel density. What we've essentially done by increasing the size of the texture is squeeze more pixels onto the object's surface area. The opposite is true as well. By decreasing the texture size, we decrease texel density. An important point is that I only increase or decrease the texture size without changing the object's surface area. If I were to double the texture size and double the object's surface area, the ratio of pixels to surface area would stay the same. Therefore, the texel density would remain the same. Let's look at the second way we can alter texel density, which I alluded to a second ago. By changing an object's surface area, in this case, scaling it up, we can decrease its texel density. This is because I am increasing the surface area while keeping the texture size the same, reducing the ratio. If I were to scale the object down, I would increase texel density. Now, there's a third way we can change texel density, by manipulating UVs. If I look at the first plane's UVs, we can see that it's been unwrapped to cover the total UV space. Due to the nature of UV's tiling, increasing the size of a UV island would increase the plane's texel density. We're squeezing more of the texture into a smaller area of the UV island, once again increasing the ratio. To decrease texel density, we do the opposite, scale the UV island down. 
Okay, now before we go any further, let's look at a common misconception. The way most people tend to explain textile density to beginners or even experienced artists leads them to believe that textile density is directly equivalent or has a strict causal relationship with visual fidelity or consistency. Now, if I were to show you the two planes below, let's label them A and B, and ask why A looks different from B, most people who have been exposed to the concept of textile density, or at least been taught the way I see it taught quite commonly, would claim that plane A has a higher textile density than plane B. The surprising fact here, however, is both planes have identical textile density. They both measure 1 by 1 meter and have a 1K texture applied. So why does plane B look so much worse? Well, that's because it has an imperfect texture applied, where the scaling of the bricks is wrong and it's blurry. Still, it has the exact dimensions as the texture used on plane A, 1024 by 1024 pixels. The problem we're facing here is not one of inconsistent textile density, but of inconsistent visual fidelity or consistency. Good art direction or a consistent approach to texture design can only solve this problem. It's why, when working on a scene, whether for a game or a render, it's vital to check that the textures you're creating form a cohesive end result within the larger context. Another way of explaining this is to imagine that you give two artists a blank artboard, each identical in size, and give them the exact same amount of paint down to the last molecule. Without them being able to look at each other's work, you ask them to paint two pictures that will be placed together when completed. There's a good chance that the two pictures painted won't match or work well together. It fundamentally doesn't matter that they had the same sized artboard and paint to work with. In that situation, you can compare the artboards and paint to textile density and the pictures the artist drew to the visual fidelity or consistency. Assuming that what I've said has resonated with you, you're probably now wondering why you or anyone else should care about textile density if it won't help us avoid creating visually inconsistent assets. And that's a great question, which I'll answer next. Why does textile density matter? Well, we care about textile density in two specific circumstances. When dealing with a single, isolated object, and when dealing with a scene comprised of many objects at various possible distances from the camera. Let's start with the first situation, the context of an isolated object. For this example, we have a simple pillar. However, its texture looks inconsistent. Let's inspect the UVs of this object. The UV islands take up varying amounts of UV space despite having similar total surface areas. However, the islands have different texel densities. We can be more precise with this. I'll be using the Texel Density Checker add-on by Ivan Vostrikov. You can grab it from Gumroad. I'll leave a link in the video description. If I select the top part of the pillar and hit Calculate TD, we can see that it's roughly 2 pixels per centimeter. If we choose the band below that, we can see it's approximately 3 pixels per centimeter. Finally, let's look at the bottom band. 14.5 pixels per centimeter. Now, because this object's faces share the same texture but have different texel densities, there will be a natural loss of detail on faces with lower texel densities compared to faces with higher texel densities, as they have fewer pixels assigned to them. If this object is to be seen from multiple different angles, depending on the severity of the texel density and consistency, it may break immersion or cause an undesirable visual discrepancy. Side note, this situation differs from the one described in the previous section on textile density misconceptions. We're dealing with a single texture. It's assumed that the visual fidelity of the texture is consistent. Of course, there can always be rare situations where that's not the case, but that's a rabbit hole for another day. So in a situation where this object will be viewed from all sides, we'd want the same level of detail across this entire surface area. We can achieve this by ensuring the object surface area, or faces, have the same textile density. The easiest way to do that in Blender is to unwrap the object, select all UV islands, and normalize them by choosing Average Island Scale. You can also achieve this with many different UV unwrapping and packing tools, such as UV Pack Master, which I highly recommend for working with UVs. However, I plan to cover that topic in a separate UV Unwrapping Masterclass video. Now, there are cases when we might deliberately choose not to have uniform textile density across an object's surface area. In a situation where this object may only be seen primarily from one side, say from below, we should prioritize the texel density for those visible faces. We can achieve that by scaling down the less critical areas, 
leaving room to scale up the more essential areas. Of course, if a particular face or set of faces on an object will never be seen, it makes more sense to delete them instead of trying to optimize their use of UV space. Okay, let's now look at the second context in which textile density matters. A scene with multiple objects. For this demo, I have two Suzanne objects and a camera. Both objects are identical in size and have an 8K texture applied. If we look at the scene from the camera's perspective, we'll notice that one object looks larger than the other. This is due to the objects being at different distances from the camera. However, it should be evident that if we render this image, each object will take up a different number of pixels on the screen. For instance, the larger object may take up an area of 500 by 500 pixels and the small object an area of 200 by 200 pixels. Given that both objects have an 8K texture applied, which is 8192 by 8192 pixels, you can already tell there's a mismatch here. How exactly does an area of 67,108,864 pixels fit on an area of 250,000 pixels? Well, the simple fact is they don't. They need to undergo a process known as downsampling. If it was the other way around, it's called upsampling. There are many different algorithms for downsampling and upsampling, such as MIP mapping, box sampling, nearest neighbor interpolation, bicubic spline interpolation, and so forth. We won't discuss them further, but it's worth knowing that the up and down sampling process occurs. When dealing with real-time graphics applications, such as games, we want to be as efficient as possible regarding textures. Therefore, if an object in our game world is only taking up a few hundred pixels on the screen, we don't want to waste unnecessary time processing that image or filling up VRAM with large textures that are only being downsampled, essentially throwing away a bulk of the data and visual details they contain. So this is where textile density comes into play. When we know that a particular set of objects will and can be viewed up close by the player or active camera, we want them to have a higher textile density than those that will be always seen from a distance. No exact formula will tell you what textile density each object in your scene should be, but there are ways to arrive at a general number and standard practices you can follow. Let's look at a few examples. If you're creating a game or dealing with a scene where the player or active camera can get relatively close to objects, a textile density target of 10.24 pixels per centimeter or 20.48 pixels per centimeter is a good starting point. In first-person shooters, for example, most objects the player can run up to and look at are 10.24 pixels per centimeter. At the same time, the weapon they have in their hands might be 20.48 pixels per centimeter as it'll always be the closest object to the camera. In third-person games, most objects the player or active camera can get close to are around 5.12 pixels per centimeter. Most top-down or strategy games, objects sit around the 2.56 pixel per centimeter range. Now, these numbers I'm giving you aren't gospel. You still have to make informed decisions, and if you're working in a team, decide on what textile density targets all artists will follow. One method to help determine what textile density you'll use for objects is to take your target render resolution as a starting point. Imagine you're creating a first-person game and aiming for a 4K target resolution. You can take a flat plane representing the rough bounding box or area of an object in your game world and then determine how close a player can get to it. Then calculate how many pixels that plane would take up at your target resolution. If it's roughly 2048 by 2048 pixels and the plane is 100 by 100 centimeters in size, then you have a textile density target of 20.48 pixels per centimeter. You can repeat this process for other critical objects in the game at various distances from the camera. Remember, you won't use the same textile density for every object in your game. Some objects will always be distant and the player will never get close to them. Therefore, they will never take up as much screen space as objects players can get close to. Okay, let's take everything we've covered so far and put it to use in a practical example. Here I have an imaginary level for a first-person game. The red object here is the player. I've also marked out different regions of the level. The region in green is the playable area, so the player can see all of these objects up close. The region in yellow is just outside of the playable area. The region in red signifies the area near the very edges of the level. Now, I've discussed the technical targets with the art team. We've concluded that we want to aim for a textile density of 10.24 pixels per centimeter for the objects in the green region, a target of 5.12 pixels per centimeter in the yellow region, 
and a target of 2.56 pixels per centimeter in the red. So let's start with one of our green region objects. I'll select it and head over to the UV editing workspace. Let's take an initial measurement and see where we stand regarding texel density. We can do that by selecting all of the faces and calculating the TD using the texel density checker add-on. We're aiming for 10.24 pixels per centimeter, so we're not quite there yet. This process takes a few iterations, so start from the top. We need to tell the add-on our texture size, but we have yet to determine it. So I'll use 512 pixels as a starting point. Next, with all the faces selected, let's set the texel density to 10.24 pixels per centimeter. You'll notice that the UV islands have been scaled up. However, they currently exceed the UV coordinate space. The conclusion? Given this object's size, or total surface area, a texture of 512 by 512 pixels isn't the right size for a 10.24 pixel per centimeter texel density. Let's try the next texture size up. Now we have a more desirable result. We've had a 10.24 pixel per centimeter TD, and the UV islands are within the total UV space. However, we do have a new problem. From an efficiency standpoint, we're only partially using all the UV space available. In fact, we're only using about half of it. Now, I've intentionally caused this issue to talk about what we can do from here. There are a few options. Option 1, if you or your team require strict adherence to the TD targets and aren't strict on the percentage of UV space utilized, you could stop here and call it done. However, this is often different from the reality. Most game studios require at least 75% of UV space to be utilized. Option 2. Suppose your TD targets are treated more as soft targets or guidelines. In that case, you'll want to go through the process to get to this point and achieve the TD target at a minimum, then pack and scale your UV islands to take up as much of the UV space as possible. This does mean your final texel density will be higher, but that's usually fine, assuming you aren't orders of magnitude out of bounds. Option 3. If you have numerous objects in a scene, level, or map that will be shown together, you pack multiple of them into a single texture. This method is commonly known as texture atlasing. Option 4. Given that texel density is a ratio between pixels and surface area, you could increase or decrease the object's surface area or add more or less geometry. This is tricky and assumes that the object scale isn't critical. For instance, if you were dealing with a bicycle, it shouldn't be twice the player's size. In contrast, a generic looking crate wouldn't break the player's immersion in the game if it was one and a half times bigger than it should be. Option 5. Non-square packing. Suppose a 1024 by 1024 pixel texture only provides 50% UV coverage at a particular texel density. In that case, you may achieve close to 100% coverage using a 1024 by 512 texture instead. This is a slightly more advanced method, but applicable and supported by most game engines. If you'd like to explore any of the options I've mentioned or learn how to use them, I'll be producing further masterclass videos on UV unwrapping and texturing that outline each in detail. To complete the demonstration, you'd follow the same procedure for every asset. You'd then have a collection of assets with specific texel densities and target texture sizes, which you or the art team can take into Marmoset Toolbag or Substance Painter, for example, and begin texturing. Alright, well, I hope this video has been informative and you've gained a more profound knowledge of texel density. If you have questions, feel free to comment or join our Discord server, we'd love to see you there. Thanks for watching.